When it comes to critical and financial successes, Sony surprised everyone when it went into the console market in the 1990s. Back when Nintendo and Sega dominated, Sony's little grey box had a lot riding on it. Cue some 25 plus years later with four home consoles under their belt, and Sony are very much still at the top. Yet despite that success, it hasn't always been smooth sailing for the Japanese tech giant. From hardware to software, Sony are a very reactive company. The competition's doing achievements, well, we'll do trophies. Xbox Live, we've got the PSN. Virtual reality? launch the PlayStation VR. Tiny retro NES selling like crazy just put together a mini PS1. These highs and lows are what makes Sony PlayStation so fascinating to watch, and having been with them since day one, there are a lot of stories to tell. I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com, and these are the eight biggest PlayStation risks that totally backfired. Number eight, the PlayStation 3 launch price. As a rule of thumb in business, it tends to be wait for the competition to launch, then undercut the price a bit to sell more. Sell at less, but sell more in the long run. However, it seems someone at Sony's marketing team didn't get the memo when the company was launching the PS3. Already lagging behind the Xbox 360's launch, Sony had to do something to catch up. However, offering the 60 gig model at £425, nearly £150 more than the Xbox, was not the way. Even at that price, Sony were reportedly working at a loss per unit, telling people they would want to take up two jobs to be able to afford it. Eventually, Sony balked, and the price was lowered to something more consistent with the competition. For a time, though the PS3 was considered too expensive compared to the relatively manageable Xbox 360. Number 7. The original version of PS Now Whilst it's taken as a staple of gaming now, back in 2012, monthly offerings of titles were seen as a bold new way to play that just sounded too good to be true. What didn't help was Sony's grandiose boasts about how streaming could work across mediums, as well as for backwards compatibility. It did come to fruition eventually after Sony sunk a huge amount of money into streaming service Gaikai to create PlayStation now, which offered a vast range of games to play. The problem now is that Microsoft have done it better than Sony ever did, creating a completely different infrastructure that's only gone from strength to strength. A much bigger catalogue of backwards compatible games to download rather than stream, as well as many new and exclusive games at launch. Both these pillars see Game Pass miles ahead of PlayStation Now, even though now launched years ahead. When Microsoft then tagged on their version of streaming, the whole idea of monthly rollouts landed way more naturally. Number 6. Crippling Backwards Compatible for PS3. The PlayStation 2 was great for many reasons, but one of the biggest successes was allowing fans to keep their PlayStation 1 collections. This was a good move, as it allowed those on the fence to keep their classic games without fear of them becoming redundant. It was only fair to assume that the PS3 would follow suit, to which it absolutely did not. PlayStation games were fine at the sacrifice of lacking memory card support, which was a fair enough compromise as internal cards could be made from storage. No biggie unless you had a 100 plus hour of Final Fantasy VIII that you wanted to get back to. The same could not be said though for PlayStation 2 games. There were only two PS3 models that could play them, the Paltry 20 and 60 gig ones. As such, these became desirable and then super hard to find. It seemed like an odd move from Sony to skip a generation, considering the PlayStation 2 had such a massive library of games. What's made it more insulting over time is releasing those PS2 games on a digital library when they could have just been playable in the first place. Nothing more annoying than paying twice for a game that sat right there on your shelf. Number 5. Banking on a Halo killer. Halo, Microsoft's first person shooter series, is a behemoth. No bones about it, it's built up a fandom and millions in revenue since that 2001 debut. As such, Halo shifts Xboxes. Naturally, the competition wanted some of that in the 2000s, and Sony would try it not once, but quite a few times. Killzone, which was an ambitious but poorly executed PS2 title in 2004. It started a franchise, but it wasn't as groundbreaking as expected. Resistance, three arcade style FPSs and two handheld games later, currently shelved by Insomniac since 2012. Fun enough, but it seems to have been completely forgotten. Hayes, the loudest proclaimer of the Halo killers, it absolutely flopped at launch. Terrible story, worse gameplay, and a mostly brown colour palette saw it lambasted at the very beginning. The problem is the moniker itself, Halo Killer. It attaches a certain stigma, an expectation that a game will come along and topple Master Chief himself. A game so amazing that it'll make Xbox or PC fans flock to PlayStation in their droves. Instead, Sony needed to stop chasing that halcyon dream. Make something original, in as much as you can in the FPS mold, that stands on its own merits. Funnily enough, Sony have now acquired Bungie, so maybe that'll happen in the near future. Number 4. Completely botching the PlayStation Vita Speaking of killer, 
killers, Sony tried to break into the market with their DS killer, the PlayStation Portable, in 2004 and 2005. It didn't top Nintendo's handheld empire, but that didn't stop Sony from trying again. The PS Vita then had the potential to be something great. Dual thumbstick control, superior graphics, and a host of PS3 and some PS4 compatibility. On paper, it was a very impressive piece of kit, and something I'm a personal huge fan of. First party games like Uncharted and Killzone Mercenary were great showcase titles, while retro fans could play their digital PS1 archive on the go. It should have all been Sony's redemption, such that if it couldn't beat the DS, it could at least join it alongside. While Nintendo did their 3D thing, Sony could go down the total technical powerhouse angle instead. Whilst very much a console hobbyist darling now, a convoluted online payment system for multiplayer and forcing proprietary memory cards killed hype stone dead. Despite selling moderately well, the lack of support from Sony as they now dealt with focusing attention on the PlayStation 4 meant that the Vita fizzled out entirely. It's regarded as a failure in the opinion of most, and Sony have never tried the handheld market again. Number 3. PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale It's not unreasonable to assume that most gamers are aware of Smash Brothers in some capacity. Nintendo's beat -em up franchise has a massive fan base, to the point where even some familiar but not owned by PlayStation faces have dropped in. Solid Snake and Cloud Strife, to name a couple, are in various Smash entries over the years. Sony very much wanted in, pitting recognisable faces like Nathan Drake, Sly Cooper, and Killzone 2's Colonel Raddock against one another. It was all off to a very rocky start, with that limited no crash or spyro lineup, but maybe the gameplay would make up for such a less than stellar cast. Sadly, not. Whilst not terrible, it just wasn't wasn't very good. Nowhere near as fun or engaging as the competition, this felt every bit like Sony just cashing in, not allowing the dev time or paying the right licenses to get it right. Number 2. Almost removing old titles from sale When it was announced that Sony's Game Pass equivalent Spartacus might offer tiers of payment to play older games, old school fans were pretty excited. However, it nearly came at a massive cost to those very same people. See, Sony were going to abolish all the old classics from their stores. All PS1 and PS2 titles readily available right now were going to be discontinued on older consoles. That meant that if players had already bought them but not downloaded, fine, but otherwise they'd be lost. Presumably this was to incentivize people to adopt newer consoles or payment methods, but as you can imagine, it didn't go down very well. The PS3, PSP, and Vita still function well enough as a go-between for the classics, so removing that entire catalogue is a big mistake. Sony eventually recanted, but not without adding a caveat. You can't just buy them anymore. Players will have to go through a wallet-slash-credit system through the console, rather than just outright purchasing a title. Had the uproar not been loud enough, Sony would have deleted an entire era of seminal gaming, all to push a new subscription service. And number 1. The PlayStation Classic Yet another example of Sony see Nintendo do and try to emulate it, in the PS1 Mini's defense, this could have been a good thing, considering the PlayStation's overall back catalogue. When it was announced that Final Fantasy VII, Resident Evil, and Tekken 3 were all on there, all signs pointed to an easy win. But where was Gran Turismo? Crash Bandicoot, or Tomb Raider, or maybe even the vastly superior Resident Evil 2. Throwing controllers back to pre-analog sticks pads didn't help, and emulation itself was surprisingly terrible, playing things like Metal Gear Solid or Final Fantasy VII with stuttering frame rates. Whilst licensing plays a big part, there could have been a better selection of titles for this little grey box's lifetime. It didn't help that hackers soon opened this up and realised all the classics we did want on there were tested at one time or another. The work just wasn't done afterwards to secure those games licenses for launch. The PS1 Classic just didn't sell, and what could have been a lovely little collectible fueled with nostalgia was instead a straight up commercial flop. Here's to a mini PlayStation 2 Classic getting everything right if Sony ever decide to try again. And those are the biggest PlayStation risks that totally backfired. Let me know your own stories being a fan of PlayStation over the years down in the comments below, and please subscribe to the What Culture Gaming podcast. For now, I've been Scott from WhatCulture.com, and I'll catch you soon.